And so I uh, grew up with this topic and also uh, straight from the age of five uh, with tools for overall for communication for visually impaired and blind people. And I know very good that without such tools, um, for example, my education never uh, would have been possible. I attended a commercial college and attended uh, normal schools with normal sighted people uh, around me. And after this, I studied law in Austria and then I became an entrepreneur. So um, I used screen readers uh, to, to read all my books and so on. So um, I think communication tools are the key uh, for all participation of visually impaired and blind people. And especially the labor market is a very uh, important thing for this. So uh, in times of Corona, uh, we see, uh, doesn't matter if anyone has a disability or not, we see that online tools and uh, communication tools over uh, computer are much more important at the moment. And so I think um, a key aspect for visually impaired persons is, to have access to these tools. So these tools should be accessible to use because if they are not, um, the whole world of, we will talk about it later, a whole world of new labor market and new um, jobs out there, a new way of doing their jobs would be closed and there would be a barrier for visually impaired and blind people. So I think, it's important to, to um, not only have several special communication tools for visually impaired and blind people in the labor market, uh, this is important too, but especially existing communication tools like Teams, Zooms, and so on should be accessible. Mm -hmm. On regard to the education, on regard to university, for example, should, Pilar, should there be more uh, should, should there be more education or should there be more uh, accessibility implemented in the curricula, for example, of the universities? Yes, yes, definitely. Um, well, first of all, I would like to thank uh, you, Klaus, for inviting me to this round table. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, I, I think so. Training to me, of course, being at the university, training to me is one of the ways to go about it. And uh, Yes, I think people with disabilities are very important, but perhaps to me, it is even more important to train people without disabilities that they will employ people with disabilities. Because I think people without disabilities are not aware uh, that perhaps uh, with almost no extra um, hardware or no extra, they could employ people with, people with low vision or people bl blind. Uh, and, and I think it's because either they don't know or because they are not aware or because so I think training is very important, but also training uh, for those who will employ people with disabilities. So, yes, training to me is the solution and we need more courses. I think we need to uh, have accessibility across in a, in a horizontal for everyone, because everyone could eventually employ people and think of jobs and um, I think accessibility should be um, horizontally um, taught and trained across all disciplines from architecture to medicine to anything, because then um, people with disabilities and, and blind and low sighted would enter the labor market in a sort of a normalized um, situation. That would be ideal for me. Okay. Klaus, you, you, is, you is the one who is the, the very veteran uh, and field of accessibility and, and so on, because I I got to know accessibility at, at the university in Linz. Uh, and I think you are in this field since how many years? I don't know. Uh, Thank you for making me older than I look. Like. <laughs> <laughs> I 
yeah. Uh, the, que the question that came, that came up uh, in the preparatory thing and the preparatory discussions were: uh, Is there is there really one labor market, or is the labor market as we know him uh, for persons with disabilities uh, the labor market that we know in the future? That's, that's a very good question. Thanks for making me uh, that old. Yes, I'm working. In oh, this sorry, I'm. All... No, no, that's. I like that. Yeah, I like to get old. Nobody wants to be old, but every, every, everybody wants to get old. So that's good. Uh, Thirty-five years. Yes, that's a long time, and I was privileged to start early. Uh, yes, one thing we should discuss with all these new technologies, we talk about the labor market, and most of the time we talk about situations where we think about an employer and an employee in bigger companies, in fixed settings, and this as technology is disruptive everywhere, and we see everywhere also the labor market is changing, more and more self-employment more and more, uh, so to say, working from home, in particular now to the crisis and everything. And the labor market and most of our train or a lot of our trainings, which we have are still oriented towards such a traditional view on the labor market, although the situation did already change and will change even more in the next years. So I think it is, high time to consider what are the profiles, what are, what are we expecting, what is the situation, the individual, the personal need of the person, and then consider what are the tools which they can use to develop a profile which is useful for, yeah, let's say a market. Is it labor market or whatever? And this is, I think, still, not really clear to me what are the profiles what are the job fields in the future mm -hmm. we have a lot for example uh possibilities i think coming up in the accessibility sector itself what i do not see a lot is at the moment only one example people with disabilities to get trained as accessibility experts themselves there are many many disability or accessibility experts for people with disabilities, but I don't see a lot of disabilities working in the accessibility field itself, but there are much more. So it's constantly changing at the moment. And uh, the, good, the big question, how can we grasp this development? We do a project which is called RADAR at the moment where we try to develop such new fields or job situations uh, in the field of blind and visually handicapped people together uh, with uh, organizations for blind and visually handicapped in different countries. And yeah, it is really a challenge to grasp what it is in the future what we will work on. Mm -hmm. And thanks for organizing this, uh, Klaus, and the challenge of bringing people together. <laughs> no problem. Adi, uh, from your perspective as, a, as an organization which is working with blind and visually impaired persons, I think you have a, a own help desk uh, for uh, the touched persons uh, because you have seen the problem when all are working remotely, uh, then you need to have help uh, if you, uh, some kind of some kind of help desk or something like that. Uh, uh, if you want, if you want to work from home. Yeah, what's, your, what, what's your experience here? Yeah. So thank you, Klaus, for organizing and for inviting me. Yes. Uh, what we found out at Migdalor is that it's one thing to enable people to work remotely, uh, but it's another thing. How do you cope with the problems that come up while they're working? because as long as they're in an office environment, usually there'll be somebody around to assist them. But what happens if they work from home? And now I think with the pandemic, there'll be more and more jobs remote. And how do they cope with difficulties that come up during that time? And what we did at Migdalor is we, we set up a help desk specifically for people with visual impairment and blindness. It is manned by people with visual disabilities, 
They are experts in hardware and software, and they can really assist people remotely uh, because they understand the challenges that these users face uh, while uh, trying to do something either on a smartphone, especially on a smartphone, I think that's even more challenging than on a computer. And we provide a free of charge service to users in Israel who have a visual impairment, who run into technical difficulties in uh, performing jobs on certain platforms or on certain uh, uh, software. Uh, uh, so, so, so as to really enable them to get remote support and continue with their work while being on their own, working at their workstation in their home. Okay, so Neha, you are you're an, uh, an entrepreneur too. You, are, you have a staff about 15, 20 persons or something like that, yeah? Uh, and most of them are persons with disabilities. So I'm sure you have some blind and visual impaired persons too in your staff. Uh, how do you maintain uh, the office work uh, in in remote in remote situations, for example? What are the tools that are you that, that you use? Okay, so um, I'll speak for uh, uh, my organization. So mo most of our employees work remotely. So that has been the model uh, like since uh, the start. And we uh, do not hire based on disability. We just hire irrespective of whether they have a disability or not. And just, it happens to have more disabled people. So, which is a good thing that uh, we, the tools that we use are mostly mainstream tools, right? Because here in India specifically, assistive tech is expensive because no one covers the cost. So if you have to go for a, a like, you know, a re refreshable braille device or uh, any sort of uh, uh, an expensive cane or something, you have to put the money out of your own pocket. No one pays uh, for it. So in that case, a refreshable braille is completely out of uh, access to most of the people. And uh, so it's like using the mainstream tools that are available like Zoom and uh, Microsoft Teams and making it accessible. And I would like to say more than the tech tools that we are using, it's about the human uh, involvement that makes a lot of difference here. Uh, that whatever you have, whatever roles you have. So we have some people working in pretty remote locations where sometimes, you know, if they are working at the bottom of the pyramid, they might not even have a smartphone. Right. So the jobs that are being assigned to them are something that are voice enabled that they can do it with a regular phone as well. So you do the mapping of the job roles with the resources that are available at that place and whatever uh, uh, we can uh, invest in in the resources as a company as well. So that makes a lot of difference uh, because you have to think of the cost factor in every communication tool or assistive tech that you are employing or deploying. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. and thank you. And Nick, when we change to, to the United States of America, you are sitting in the heartland of uh, tech. Uh, can, you, can you see that there is a evolution in the tech industry towards the accessibility in inclusion or towards the the implementing towards implementing uh, accessibility features uh, as a normal thing in in the assistive technologies especially for blind and visually impaired visually impaired persons yes i'm happy to speak to that i'm based here in the heart of silicon valley and uh, there's some good news and some bad news. Uh, in the last year or so, there has been more of a push in companies in general toward diversity and inclusion. And that has been largely around race here in the US, uh, but it has also included disability inclusion. And that means that companies are more aware both of the need to uh, have products that are accessible uh, for people with disabilities, as well as the need to employ people with disabilities themselves um, so that they can be sure that they're developing tools that will be accessible for all people, 
and getting diverse perspectives uh, on all of their products. There are a couple of trends that I would mention. One is that we're trending away from having everyone on a fully fledged computer and more toward mobile devices that run different types of operating systems. And this unfortunately means that devices are often less able to be retrofitted for accessibility purposes than in the past. If you had a computer running uh, Microsoft Windows or Apple's Mac OS, you could install extensions and tools at the operating system level that would allow you to make uh, changes to the way the software worked to be accessible for people with a wide range of needs. This is much less the case with the popular mobile operating systems, Android by Google and iOS by Apple. Uh, on these platforms, it's not possible for a tool to have operating system wide uh, support and, and to be able to interact with all of the different apps on the device to make them more accessible. Uh, the user is instead more reliant upon the accessibility tools that are implemented by the operating system. And I will say Apple and Google do a pretty good job of staying on top of accessibility. Uh, they are some of the better technology companies in that regard. Uh, but nonetheless, there isn't the same ability to simply plug in any type of operating system level support uh, for your own accessibility needs. And so that's a challenge that we, we see still existing out there. Um, and I think that it will continue to get better. The, the companies do care about these things, but um, as you can imagine, they don't always have um, the ability to get something done within a company, even if the accessibility team is pushing for it uh, because the company has many demands on it and, um, and many challenges. So they don't ultimately um, win out in every conversation at a corporate level. Okay. okay. Yeah, add anything to this? Uh, let's let's first finish the first round and then uh, okay we are at the end we have the possibility to last the last 10 minutes to to answer questions and so on okay right. uh, david uh from your perspective we have seen we have seen us uh, i think two two hours ago and we spoke about smartphones uh, is the smartphone the only communication tool that is uh the future for persons for blind persons or visual impaired persons no, definitely not um, I think there's two really big areas that we're seeing uh, huge opportunities in. The first would be wearable technologies, um, which is giving people access to control uh, and information and resources, uh, either you know, through a, a watch on their wrist with a, a headpiece uh, for sound. Um, so it's, it's very much being carried with them at all times, uh, as well as their smartphone. But the second one, which I think is really interesting, is uh, and Klaus, we talked about this a little. Uh, we, we've, we've talked about this, uh, Internet of Things and smart home technology. So one of the things that I get from people with visual impairment that I speak, to, one of the things I'm most excited about is smart speakers, um, because actually it runs in parallel with everything else they do. So if they're in the office and there's a problem, they say. Uh, Alexa, can you call X? Alexa, can you do this? Can you tell me this piece of information? Um, so it runs in parallel with what they're doing on a computer or elsewhere. It can also be used to control the environment. If they want to listen to music. So the pervasiveness of that technology, which wasn't designed for people with, with visual impairment, but actually because its interface is very much uh, voice, both input and output, um, they sort of sit there and say, well, okay, it wasn't designed for me, but you know what? That's what I've been asking for for years. So let's mm -hmm. worry less about whether it's been accessibly designed and much more about actually it works for me and it's great. Mm -hmm. Super, super. Monica, you're frozen. Can you Hi, hear how us? How are you? No, I'm here. <laughs> I can hear you. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let, let's let's change the continent again and then go to uh, specific tasks or uh, specific challenges that we have uh, in the middle of the Americas. Uh, tell us. Yes, a little, and I was I was listening to you to you all and and Mexico and Latin America. We have with what you have in India. 
We work with people with disability, uh, visually impaired, and they rely on the technology, mainstream technology, because we are, are countries that import technology and we heavily depend on these mainstream accessibility features that we can find and in open, uh, open source software, because people with disability do not have the means to go and buy high tech, assistive or other kind of technology. So for us is awareness on accessibility is crucial. On one hand, mainstream tech devices need to have accessibility features, but on the other hand, all the software that are used in companies, intranets, websites, internal websites, in order to be able to work, need to be accessible as well, because we have so many cases of diversity and people and companies that want to hire people with disabilities and even buy them the assistive technology but the internal software and server and systems are not accessible so a person that are with disability are stuck in other kind of the, even though they have the possibility of working and and being better and have a, a career within the companies aren't able to do so so for for countries like ours for in the labor market it is two things super important that technological international provider mainstream need to be accessible. And also all the other developers need to understand that all the internet software and, and systems that they're developing for companies need also to be compatible with all those technologies. That's a, that's a good connection point, and so we, I can I can go back the round because I will start with you again and go back to to Marcus. Yeah, uh, do we have to have, do we have to be a nerd to uh, be able to uh, work with all these assistive assistive technologies that are on the market now, or uh, should I, my imp my impression is when when using a smartphone, uh, for example, elderly persons. They, they really do have problems uh, to cope with all the challenges uh, that the smartphone is, is uh, bringing to them. Uh, why we, or how can we solve the problem of digital literacy? And uh, the other thing is affordability. That's, that's, an, that's another thing. Uh, I think there are two big questions. It's literacy and it's affordability. How we can cope this problem? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. Um, okay. okay. The first thing I want to 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 highlight is that um, you you your question was, do we have to be nerds to to um, mm -hmm. be able to work with this, these these yeah. tools? Yeah. My answer and my opinion is to it depends how good these tools are made, how good they are programmed. So um, we in our company already focus this topic very often. So we see it, for example, Apple. Yeah? Um, they firstly had uh, the first smartphone with only one button or maybe two buttons, expanding the side one for uh, the sound. And um, they, they made it very intuitive. So um, the best thing would be if we have uh, products and goods and te technologies um, that are open for everyone who just try it out. So I think it should be intuitive. Our shoe, for example, um, does a vibration when you put your foot in this direction that you uh, are looking around with your foot. So it's intuitive to feel if there is an obstacle or not. And the second um, thing to, to ensure this is that um, in a second step, so first step, make it intuitive and uh, make it able to try uh, by everyone. And the second one is to have the possibility to individualize these product. We also recognize that out there, there is not only the blind guy and the visually impaired individual. Um, they, are, they are quite different. You cannot find a blind guy with a blind other guy that uh, are really straight on the same topic and are happy with the same 
technology. So everyone is different. And because of this, we really focus on individualization so that everyone can fit the product or the technology to his individual needs. And the other topic, um, what I wanted to add, what, said, what Nick said, um, he mentioned that it's quite difficult in the future to uh, have extensions to uh, like iOS um, software or to Android software um, because the, uh, the inventors of these technologies um, have to build it in on their own and does not allow to install extensions because these extensions do not have the full access to the uh, firmware inside. I think this has a good uh, side and a bad side. Um, sure, the bad side is um, these operators, Google or Android, have to do their job very well in the field of accessibility. But the, the good side is they really have to they, they are the only one who have the possibility to do this job very good. Because when I remember using uh, a Nokia smartphone, there were uh, accessible screen readers, um, talks and zooms uh, was the name of them, screen reader for a mobile phone. Sure, they were an extension to this phone, but they were always minimum one or two steps behind the Symbian firmware, which was on the smartphone. So if there was a Nokia update, then your screen reader maybe uh, didn't work anymore. Yeah? And the screen reader had never the chance to go such deep in this product than the operator today, Android or uh, iOS or so Google or Apple has because they can do it very well. All others, all extensions are still minimum one, two steps behind and do not even have the chance to, to be 100% accessible. And also what David said, so the Amazon Echo, for example, was not designed for visually impaired, but helps visually impaired. I think this is another argument why fully accessible things can only made by the mainstream product itself. So every extension that is only developed for visually impaired and blind people is sure it's, it's great because if there is nothing else out there on the market, then this extension is very, very, or has a very, very high value. That's, I don't want to, to deny, um, but no extension has the possibility to do it uh, so deep and so accessible than uh, the inventor of this product or the operator of the system itself can do. Pilar, you, you are working uh, very, very closely with the community of the deaf and, and hard of hearing persons. Uh, is, 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 it, is, it, is it really uh, useful to produce products only for one target group? Or could, we, could we come to a product that means uh, that a product that covers all the needs of the different groups of persons with disabilities, for example, for the sensual disabilities? I, I think that would be ideal. Uh, the, uh, and in fact, the, the Apple one button uh, shows that it's good for everyone, not just for the blind or it was designed for. So um, if you spend a lot of time in the design and the testing the usability of whatever you are designing from the very beginning, uh, the end result is good for everyone and not just for one group, because there is not, there is not just one group. You may be uh, blind or deaf or whatever, but then you, you become old or you become whatever. Um, and there is something that nobody is mentioning here and is the issue of languages. Uh, blind and impaired people who are not English speakers, they have a double disability because all these fantastic um, tools or this fantastic, they are not available in, if, in any other language but English. 
So I think it is very unfair because you have like a second rate uh, citizens who are not English speakers. Um, and that is also because uh, on the one hand, they are told that all these um, uh, functions and all these are available for the, by these technologies. And the truth is that they are only available in English. Um, mm. And that is never said. Uh, yeah. When we go to conferences and when Google presents how wonderful they are, and they are, they never said that this is only for English. Uh, when Microsoft, and we've been to so many conferences and we always have the same issue, only for English. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, I think the issue of languages is a, a disability in itself. So you end up with blind and, and, and low sighted people being co comorbid to have two disabilities. One is the language and the second one is their own disability. And so we should try to avoid the language issue. And I think um, uh, including usability right at the beginning should yield very good products useful for everyone. I know you, you're speaking also in minority language about, uh, <laughs> in Barcelona. Uh, exactly. But, yeah. I'm also talking about, but look, uh, in, in Europe is a very good example for this yeah. because Europe has over 200 languages. Um, so what, are we going to just disappear all the languages because we all have to speak? No, come on. So I think, um, okay, you know what I mean. Yeah, but I think when when I'm looking on the Spanish speaking market, for example, it must be it must be possible because there are so many people speaking Spanish. Uh, look to America, for example. In America, I think 40, more than forty percent of the persons are now Spanish native Spanish speakers. Yeah, uh, uh, but the language issue is also an issue, I think, in in, in India, and we come we can come back to 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 it when when we speak with with Neha then. Yeah. Uh, uh, and the minority language, that's for Adi, I think, because Hebrew, <laughs> I don't think I don't think that so many persons in the world are speaking Hebrew. <laughs> and yeah. and it's a very com trust me, it's very complicated to learn it because I tried it once and <laughs> that's not an easy thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but to come to come back to this issue of the of the one one fits it all. Uh, do you think there is one communication tool that can help all persons uh, with visual impairments uh, and everywhere around the world and, and that combines all the things like navigation and communication, Adi? Well, what, what we are trying to look at at the law is really how to bring various solutions that are tailored to people with blindness and visual impairment into one holistic solution. So it won't be one solution for this and another solution for that, which makes it very problematic to hand. So one of the things that we do is to really look, how can we put a few solutions into one and enable people to function at a certain job or at a certain function in life, like you know, walking from point A to point B in the city and be able to do so while getting all the various assistance, it could be an issue of, uh, of uh, navigation, it could be an issue of accessibility, it could be an issue of um, uh, you know, not running into obstacles or not getting into dangers. Try to build a few solutions into one. But another point that I do want to raise regarding what was spoken here before is the issue of training to what does exist in the market. Because while we do believe that it is very important to influence the big companies to develop products uh, to accessibility and make what they do more accessible, I think another issue like the practical day-to-day -day and what we try to really do a lot at the law is to train people for those solutions that do exist. Because we believe that many of them can apply to people with visual impairment and blindness just as they apply to others in a sense. Is there a tool out there? Let's enable those people by training them to use the tools that are out there for the general population, not just to limit ourselves to where accessibility is good, 
but to try as much as possible to train people to use those mainstream common solutions out there that we all use day to day. And this way lower the barrier of people with vision impairment and blindness to uh, equality in the, in the labor market. I've seen Andrea is here instead of uh, instead of Klaus. Uh, Klaus was after Pilar. So, Andrea, uh, communication is 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 is, is uh, uh, in in our in our in our uh, point of view when a blind person wants to communicate with uh, with an with a person which is not blind or visually impaired, uh, why always does the blind person have the tools to uh, speak with the other side which is not disabled? Why are there, there are no tools to make uh, the normal uh, person speaking with the blind with the with the disabled persons? Is there any tool there or? There's a very one. There's, there's, there's a very asymmetric uh, thing. You see, you know what I mean. Yeah, you. One of the one one of the most one of the most most told sentences is you are muted. I'm muted, so I'm unmuted. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm replacing Klaus because he was not able to join the whole session. And if I understood your question right, Klaus, and thank you for not telling that I did your final exam with you because in, in web accessibility, so I'm at least the same age as Klaus. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> or as long as in accessibility as he is. So if I understood your question right, you asked me, uh, why is it always the person with a disability that has to, that has to deliver the solution yes. for, for, for a good communication? Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, to be true, uh, perhaps these persons are just more intelligent. No, that's kidding. <laughs> uh, it is. Uh, uh, it is more or less uh, our society, I think. It's it's the society. It's not a blaming that you have the disability, you have to care to take care for for anything else, but it's also a not knowing how to best react. You know what I mean? And it's uh, and 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 especially for communicating the needs, the personal needs, and what the people want and what the people need for 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 interacting in society and for and for cooperating, it's the person with the disability, him or herself. It's the only person that knows what he or she wants or needs. So we must see and we must take these persons as experts. Of their own, of their own life, of their own situation, and uh, give them, and give others also the, the 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 tools at hand to be able to comply, to be able to cooperate, to be able to be to be part of of community and 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 of society. Um, and, and, and another aspect of this is it's it's also about this universal accessibility. I work in this area for long enough that I don't believe in miracles anymore. So the, the, the tool that knows everything and can, can do everything and can help everything and everyone, this will just not exist. This is called mommy or wife or whatever, but <laughs> it's, not, it's not to be bought. Yeah. So uh, I think what we need is what David already explained, it's flexibility in use. So never mind what you design for what, but if it's not intuitive from first point, it needs to be flexible. And if it's flexible, it's, it's way more easy to use it for communication, to use it for something different than it was intentioned. And this is the point where we are. Because the sentence, uh, it, 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 was, it was the first stuff that I heard from Klaus when I started working in this, in this domain was, uh, in earlier days, it was, Technology defines and the humans adapt. And this has to be changed. The human defines and the technology adapts. And in this moment, when this is when this is working, because this is also this is also valid for developers, for developers of tools and of software. So they before knowing every every little single aspect of accessibility, why don't we give them tools to produce accessible stuff from the very first step. So 
it, it, it would be much easier. It would be way easier. We, we try to, to, to propose and hand in uh, research stuff for almost 20 years in this domain. But perhaps if I tell it here, we can find some critical mass. Some, some, some critical mass to push this forward because user-centered design is not only design with and for people with a disability or with the aging population, but it's designed for us all. Yeah. See, today I have here this wonderful iPad. I love it. I made some notes here, some keywords I want to say. And what happened? I realized that after three minutes, this thing goes to power safe. And it's dark. And you can imagine I'm looking here in the camera. I'm trying to look friendly and nice. I'm trying not to mix up my sentences. And what happens? My keynotes, which woof, black away. So this throws everybody out of anything. So I tried to find out what happened. And it was during the last update. And because of security issues, my wonderful iPad decided I only need the screen active for two or five minutes. Oh my gosh, what shall I do now? Shall I enter my 2020 key password now? No. Uh, I found in a, in, a, in a very, 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 very hidden directory, I found it to dis dis disable this. And this is what I mean. The tools must be way easier, way more intuitive and way more flexible. And this is not only valid for, for, for people at, at the risk of exclusion, but for us all. So to sum up all this, uh, people should know how to community with uh, how to communicate and how to get in touch with each other, of course. Uh, and they should use and they should take whatever they need for it. Yeah, but it should not be the the the, um, the burden just to one person, and it is not the burden to one person because we have a lot of a lot of people here listening to us. We have a lot of people discussing here with us and 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 and, and, and telling their experiences here. We are able to listen to each other, but the the only thing we need to have in mind is we cannot know everything. So let's make it flexible. Let's make it easy to access. Let's make it more more easy to to have it interactive and and individual to be individual in individualized. And then uh, there's not there's no need that everybody gets a nerd as you designed it, where I want to say nerd is not the right term for it. Yes, I stop. Sorry. I stop. Just give me one Sorry. sentence. But nerd is not right. It's called geek because a nerd is socially awkward, and the geek is a digital technology expert and enthusiast. And <laughs> it's me, the geek, telling you this. <laughs> Thank sorry, you so sorry, much. Sorry, I'm, sorry, I'm, but, I'm but, over. but that's the second most cited uh, sentence uh, since COVID. Uh, yeah. We are running out of time. Yes, I know. Yeah. And are you here? <laughs> 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 and thank Neha, you so much for, for, Neha, for having the, the possibility here. Yeah, thank you. Neha, language uh, is, is uh, a big topic, I think, in India, because I don't know how many hundred or thousand languages you're speaking in India. Uh, <laughs> and... We have 22 official languages <laughs> and uh, thousands are spoken. Yeah, so, okay. Yeah. So that's all. Uh, also, how, how, how is communication between between uh, all these, these these languages? What, what, what about uh, blind persons from uh, speaking another language, for example? So yeah, so there are uh, some communication tools that have adapted to regional languages because we have, uh, India is actually like one of the most populated countries in the world. We have like one point, almost 1.4 billion now. So, um, uh, and we have the maximum number of blind people in the world by the stats. So, uh, how many? Uh, oh. That I'll have to look at the no, right, okay. biggest number. Oh. But yes, uh, we have the maximum number of because most of the blindness is preventable in rural areas where healthcare is not available. So that's why that's the reason. So uh, coming back to uh, the question that you asked, so re many of the tools, because they see it as a huge market, they adapt. So like Alexa, like David has mentioned in the chat, it supports Hindi, which is one of the uh, uh, hugely spoken uh, language in uh, northern part of India. And many people uh, across the country understand that. So they have adapted to it. Google Meet has uh, 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 like captioning in Hindi available. So there, there are adaptations that even the bigger companies are seeing it as a huge market and adapting. And plus there are some regional solutions 
regional softwares that are being adapted for people who have uh, uh, regional language as their first language. But uh, we also, at least in the urban areas, English is uh, uh, spoken language for, uh, what do you say, in the white collar job market, so to say, where we uh, Indian, Indian companies employ a lot of people with disabilities. So that is also uh, one of the positives of, uh, you know, we have a requirement of regional languages and companies are finding it uh, as a huge market, but yes, English adaptability is also great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would like to add because the smartphones also have these regional languages. So if you look at yep. uh, uh, any of the devices, whether it's Apple or Android devices, they all have regional languages. So if you go down south, you have the South Indian languages like Malayalam or Tamil and the phone they use in that language. So the adaptability is there. And like Andrea mentioned, it has to be intuitive. And the technology exists today where uh, the self-learning devices can uh, make a lot of difference. Nick, where are you? Ah, okay. <laughs> because you have changed the position in the, on the screen. Yeah? Uh, United States of America is also is always the melting pot uh, from the European point of view. Uh, so you also have various uh, a, a big variety of, of persons coming from all over the world uh, uh, it cannot be only english that is the that is the, the, the connection the connection point what is what is what is about communication for blind persons which are migrants for example coming to the united states of america yeah that's a very good point uh, we do have uh, a lot of different languages spoken here in the US, primarily uh, Spanish, I would say, is the primary second language here. Uh, and that's something that has an impact, especially on the, the technology companies that are based primarily in California, um, where we have a larger population. So um, as I mentioned before, we have a bit of a push in terms of uh, diversity and inclusion. I would say that's part of uh, what we're seeing here. I think there are a couple of other trends that I would note um, over the last 10 years and then looking forward sort of to the next 10 years. Over the last 10 years, we have had app uh, ecosystems available on these mobile devices. And even though there are not uh, operating system level extensions allowed, in the last year or two, uh, companies have realized that you can make browsers that have extensions. and. On Android, there is the Kiwi browser that supports uh, extensions from the Chrome Web Store. And on iOS, uh, there's a new browser that launched uh, earlier this month that's called Insight. And they support extensions that can be made in JavaScript or uh, even in a, a no-code solution. And I think uh, it's taken a while for companies to uh, realize there is this opportunity. but um, I think it's going to become popular uh, as people realize that you can now make extensions, maybe not operating system wide, um, but browser wide uh, and, and many apps are accessible through a browser. And so that will be very advantageous. Um, and then the other trend uh, that, that I think about as we look forward to the next few years um, is that devices will adapt with foldable screens, which will be very helpful for people who have low vision. You can have something that fits in your pocket, but is not tiny to look at. Uh, and that will be helpful for the visually impaired community, as well as anyone who wants to be able to see something more easily. Mm -hmm. David, let's come to another place of the world. You, you lived for a long time in the in Arabic countries. Uh, what, what's interesting for me is uh, the first communication tools blind persons normally learn when, when they are blind from, from birth is Braille. Uh, is there a prevalence of, of Braille in, in, the, uh, in the Arabic countries? Or do, they, do they learn Braille there? And uh, is, is, is uh, Braille one of the, one of the most uh, used communication methods, uh, for example, there? Oh, bra there's definitely uh, Braille uh, for Arabic, and um, yeah, it's quite widely used. Certainly in places like universities, there's often uh, Braille availability. Um, uh, Bibliotheca Alexandrina in Egypt uh, did a lot of work around Arabic Braille, um, which was, was very well received. But to be honest, it's just like anywhere else in the world that actually it's not just about whether you're blind, it's to do with your age, uh, the community no. you live with. 
if I went to uh, Qatar Social and Cultural Club for the Blind, which was predominantly young people, they were pretty much using screen readers on their Apple or Android phones in preference to Braille, um, just because they found it much more convenient and easier to use. So um, I, th I think the, the question about Braille versus voice and so on, uh, the, the, the demographics of the users vary. Uh, when I was dealing with much older users in Qatar and Arabic speakers and Arabic speakers from other parts of the Arabic speaking world, then maybe Braille was more widely used. Uh, but within those communities, then really it was Arabic screen readers that were by far the preferred option. Mm. So just like everybody else, really, um, Arabic speakers with vision impairment are, are complicated, really, and they, they, they refuse to just do the same thing, which would make life so much easier. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and last but not least, Monica, you have the closing remarks, you have the closing words, because we only have three minutes left. Thank Your perspective? You. And, yes, and I was look, uh, listening to you all, and I think that the most important and what we kind of need to, to go with is flexibility, because when David is talking about the different use of technology, the young versus the, the older population, it, it's the same that you don't need to have a disability to see that the same thing is happening. No? Older population with the pandemic now, we're, we're obliged to use technology and they're facing accessibility problems because they're, they're not used to do all these activities uh, uh, through, the, through the technology. So uh, I love what Andrea says that uh, technology should be adapting to mm -hmm. humans and not humans to technology. And I think that people with disability in our countries are being adapting since the beginning because they have no voice on, on how the design they have very few voice on on what they if their needs are met so yes i think that we need to create alliances we need to to create awareness and to push towards developing technology for all because in mexico also we have more than 100 languages we mainly of course the, the official language is, is spanish but we really want to to have our part of a culture is indigenous culture with different languages that are dying and could not and could with technology revive so flexibility i think is key and technology for all for all of us and please technology adapt to us and not us to you and i love that phrase mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i think that there, there's one there's one very famous book uh, uh design book uh that has the title don't make me think I think that's one of the most important things. Yeah, uh, nobody wants to to read a description or to, to read uh, something three hundred pages to be able to use a, a product or something like that. Yeah, uh, that's one of the one of the most important sentences that I've heard. Or two sentences. Uh, the first one is keep it straightforward and simple, and the second one is don't make me think. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you all. We are. At the point, it's it's three o'clock in the afternoon here in, in, in Vienna, and we have to close it down. Uh, many thanks to all the participants. Uh, I leave the room open for another two minutes because if you want to write in your uh, email address for the uh, participants that want to write you an email or something like that, you can put it into into the chat, please. Uh, and. But officially now we we uh, we stop the uh, the screen uh, the, the the recording of the session. Uh, but I leave it open for another five minutes. Perhaps somebody has to say something or some somebody wants to write uh, his or her email in the chat. Okay, thank you. <laughs>